The history of the control circuitry used in built-in vacuums is interesting enough to me that I thought I'd make a video and show some of my examples of, uh, of this stuff. Starting in the early days of built-in vacuums in the 1910s and 20s, the vacuum system was piped in by the plumbing or the heating contractor that didn't really do electrical work. So your electrical feed to the central vacuum was done by the electrician. And this included some kind of uh, control for the motor, the simplest being a switch right at the machine. Uh, if you wanted to get a little fancier than that, you could have a switch above each inlet or next to each inlet. And uh, I've got a picture of that. So this is a picture from the Pittock Mansion in Portland, Oregon. And you can see on their 2X system, in one of the inlets, there's a switch right next to it. And it's pretty obvious that this is for the vacuum system. This could have been a keyed switch. Uh, and that, that would be seen in public buildings or occasionally private homes. If the inlets were mounted at light switch, or if the switches were mounted at conventional light switch height, as was also common, oftentimes a red indicator would be provided so that you could see when this didn't immediately turn on the light in the living room where the switch was, you could see at least this is doing something, and if you didn't know what it did, then perhaps you'd shut it back off. Uh, but this indicated the vacuum was running, and... Uh, if these systems were far enough away, then you really couldn't hear them, so the indicator was a good thing. A lot of times in early electrical installations, when the electricity was supplanting gas lighting or kerosene lamps or whatever, uh, the routine in, in lighting up a home was the housekeeper at the beginning of the evening would go around and light all the lights and at the end of the evening go around and extinguish them all. It wasn't like today where we walk in a room and turn the light on, we walk out, we turn the light off. And so the electrical systems in large homes were often designed around that way of using them. And here's an artifact of one of those installations. This is from a large home in upstate New York that's been torn down. You can see that this one bank of switches was used for the reading room, library east, library west. And they stuck the switch for the vacuum system on this panel. Cleaner. Kind of cool. Well, these allowed the vacuum system to be running no matter whether you had a plug, a hose plugged in, whether you were cleaning anything or not, which they could take it. The centrifugal systems could just run and run. They didn't care, but it was wasteful. And so one solution to this was patented in 1918 by Cutler Hammer. And you can see... In the picture, they're using it with a 2X system, but this is a small, uniquely shaped receptacle next to the vacuum inlet, and attached to the vacuum hose is a little plug, a shorting plug, so that when this is plugged in the outlet, it completes a circuit, either starting the motor across the line or activating a relay. And you can see in here, in the case of small stationary outfits, can be used to code the motor circuit direct. But in most kinds of places that would have a built-in vacuum, uh, you would probably have a big enough machine and a large enough structure that you would use this to activate a, a relay or a contactor. And in fact, a lot of the, the mechanisms, the systems that just had the switch, this would also be switching a relay. Sometimes, like in this uh, Spencer install, so that enclosure on the wall behind it, that would have your relay in it, and here's your disconnect switch, and here is your manual switch to activate it to use the utility inlet there. Sometimes that relay was out in the open. So like here's an Arco wand in a house that's obviously been converted to a museum, and this thing is very nicely restored. And in that plexiglass box is your relay with the contacts on the top and bottom and the coil in the middle. Or, uh, I had another picture, darn it. Somewhere. Oh. Yes, 
Here is the large home known as Glensheen. This is the vacuum control panel. And you can see here, there's your disconnect switch. The knife switch is always a disconnect. It was never used to actually start and stop the machine. This is your relay. These are the coils and this is the, these rods pull these two V-shaped contacts up and complete the circuit. And this would be a manual switch to activate the machine right from the panel here. And that looks like, that looks like a light bulb socket. But going back to that, that shorting plug setup, this is a picture from Vacuum Land. This is of the Best Borough Hotel in Canada that has, it's a big old hotel with a big old Spencer in it. And next to the vacuum inlets are these weird, funny receptacles for that, that activation system. Okay, so that's, that's how they did it in the 1910s and 20s. Um, perhaps they could have used a start-stop station instead of a, a maintained contact uh, light switch type. They could have had just a momentary push button, which would latch in the relay. And then a normally closed stop button would open it. Haven't really seen this in action, but there's no reason why they couldn't have used the start-stop instead, uh, instead of a standard switch. Uh, that's how they did it. Unfortunately, in the 1920s, the late 20s, uh, the Great Depression and World War II kind of killed off built-in vacuums for a while. Portable vacuums were getting better, and built-in vacuums weren't getting any cheaper. So they were sort of uh, made obsolete, sadly. But in the 1950s, late 50s and early 60s, built-in vacuums came back. It was one of those sort of Jetsons era things that um, new technology in houses along with garage door openers and garbage disposals and intercom systems and all that stuff. And this was uh, thanks to a reduction in cost because a motor now this size could do the job of a big, huge turbine that you would need before. And also, the threaded iron piping that was so labor-intensive to install has been replaced by thin-wall slip-fit steel or aluminum tubing, or later ABS or PVC pipe. Uh, or tubing, rather. It's still tubing. But that made these systems a lot more cost-effective to install. And uh, alongside that came the idea of running... The vacuum installer running a low voltage wire from each vacuum inlet back to the main unit. They would just strap this along the pipe. That wasn't always the case though. Some of the early systems still used the light switch setup uh, and the inlets didn't have any low voltage control. In fact, here's a, uh, here's a page from a Filtex brochure. This is an installation manual from the mid to late 60s. And the machine was available either with a control box and you'd have push button inlets like this or you'd have no control box and you would wire in a 120 volt light switch and an indicator light and this says master switch and red light are located where the tools and hose are stored to start when cleaning begins and turned off when cleaning is finished of course these motors having brushes uh running them for long periods of time will tend to burn them out i mean if i started my vacuum when i started cleaning and didn't turn it off until I finished cleaning, the thing would be running for quite a long time. It's not really good for these motors. And uh, so they did get away from that fairly quickly. Here's a, here's a Kenmore, early Kenmore instruction book that says your system will have one of the following types of switches, either a rocker switch, and this would be low voltage, or touch plate switches, and these are what you usually saw. There's a little strip of copper on each inlet. Uh, or a timer switch, just a rotary, like a bathroom exhaust fan or a whirlpool timer. So that was that was an option, but more often uh, in the early systems, some of them used a two-button setup like this. Some of them used a single button like that. These are just doorbell buttons. In order to use the two buttons, you had to have what was called a dual-coil relay. And you can see on this relay, you have uh, three wires going to each inlet, a common one to start and one to stop. And one button... So one button gives a pulse of energy to one coil of this relay, closing the contacts. 
the other button gives a pulse of energy to the other coil opening the contacts. So you can see like that. In the early days the central vacuum enclosure didn't usually incorporate the relay or the transformer. The control gear was in its own little either a four square box or a purpose built enclosure. This is off of a Filtex. Uh, just lumped onto the side of the machine. This is this is actually a, a Honeywell product called a fan center. So a lot of this stuff was adapted from HVAC control gear. And this is off of a Pullman. But it's it's a 24 volt transformer and a relay it would do the job. In order to use one button to both start and stop, uh, you need to use what's called a latching relay. This is a latching relay here. This is a mechanically latching relay so that one pulse latches it and then another pulse unlatches it. So now the circuit is closed. Now it's open. And this particular setup includes an indicator light. Not so much because you couldn't hear the vacuum. That was no problem with an early Filtex or Central Vac International. You could definitely hear it. Uh, this was so that in uh, in a motel or an apartment building, then you can take turns. If uh, if the inlet in your particular apartment is lit up, then you know you have to wait to vacuum. Oh darn! Uh, so Filtex would use a setup like that. Central Vac International used that too. These setups, uh, despite being a, a an improvement over the light switch they still allowed you to have the vacuum running whether or not an inlet was open or a hose was plugged in you know kids could turn this on or uh, grant from md always talks about when these were installed in the floor like a retrofit the dog could come and step on it and then the thing would just run and so getting away from that you started to see systems where it was a non-latching relay and it required a constant current flow um, provided by either a door switch like this beautiful statuary bronze filtex inlet okay so you can see that switch there so this can only run when this door is open and a variation on this setup was a switch that was pressed in by the hose end, such as in this Black & Decker. The hose end had a flange that pressed that little button. VacuFlow's take on it with the metal inlets and the plastic inlets that came later was a switch that turned on when you open the door like that. Or here's a Kenmore floor inlet. This thing is huge. You can see that's so it's really simple. And that only allows the system to run when the hose is in the wall or when the inlet is open in, in the case of this and like this. Um, of course, you know, VacuMaid used their single pin design uh, in the 60s. And uh, really th what became the industry standard was pioneered by beam. And uh, this is a beam inlet. This is a later beam inlet, an earlier beam inlet. You can always tell the design is more like this. This is 60s. And in the beam inlet, you had two contacts, pin jacks they're called. And each one accepts one side of the low voltage circuit and so rather than having just a just a rubber hose cuff like a filtex would would have or a vacuum flow uh, you had a hose end that either had a metal band on the on the plastic or it had the end of it was all metal and this when you plug this in just shorts across those contacts starting the system now it's running now it's not and this ended up being very foolproof, very reliable, and that became the industry standard, and it has been since then. The other reason it became the industry standard is that it enabled 
control from the end of the hose, from the hose handle. This, uh, this is an early low voltage hose. I think this is a VacuFlow product, even though it's made to fit the standard beam inlets. So as soon as they could figure out how to make a hose that incorporated wires in the spirals of the hose, you could then turn your system off and on from the handle. And this hose is in poor shape, unfortunately, but this, this was a big jump. And uh, after the low voltage hose came the dual voltage hose. And uh, who was the company that did, was it, was it Spiral Flex, Spiral Electric or something that came first? Uh, or Deco used to make an electrified hose. I don't know who made the big heavy ones for Newtone, etc. But um, Plastiflex was really, really the leader in developing a lightweight electrified hose. And this is a 25-year-old Plastiflex hose. So this now, instead of having two spirals for two low voltage wires, this has four spirals because it incorporates two wires for high voltage and two for low voltage. And you can see now the end, instead of the two little tabs, we've got two plates so that no matter where those contacts hit, this will make contact. And in the handle, you can see what an early electrical hose this is. It does not swivel. And instead of the receptacle being underneath, the receptacle is right up there at the top. But the switch allows you to turn vacuum only or vacuum and power brush. And this is really uh, still kind of state of the art today. Of course, they now swivel and they've made the hoses, you know, they made some changes, but this design, the carcass design uh, was such a huge step by Plastiflex. And so that's, uh, that's still where we are as of today. Uh, one thing that you see sometimes, but has never really become the standard way to do it, is the little remote control switching systems. And uh, you can get, you since the 70s have been available, RF systems where you'd get a little remote control clicker, like for a garage door. And uh, this originally, in fact, does this Filtex brochure show it? Yes. Okay, so on the back of this... This is a mid to late 70s brochure. Radio remote control. And this, these use garage door opener products. You can see that's probably a Genie garage door remote. They just stuck Filtex on there. Uh, this was promoted as a way for the installer to save some money. And it was the original way to turn the system off and on from the end of the hose. But uh, the lack of reliability, the need to change batteries and that made this always a uh, last resort instead of the uh, the standard way to do it. The remote control is used if there is no low voltage wire, if the remote if the low voltage wire is damaged, or uh, in some municipalities like the one I live in, for a period of time, you couldn't run low voltage wire except in conduit. So your central vac installation went from costing, you know, $2,000 to costing $4,000 because you had to run conduit to each wall inlet separately. And so a lot of those systems were installed with push button uh, remote controls. And then I have to do service calls to change batteries. So anyway, hope you've enjoyed my, my display of clicky buttons and lighty lights. And thank you for watching.